In a previous video, we went over the various reasons why the United States entered World War I. Yet for perhaps the most key reason of all, we barely scratched the surface – the influence of the almighty dollar. In 1934, the US Senate formed a committee to investigate the financial and banking interests that underlay the United States' involvement in World War I, which begets the question, how large a role did finance play in the events, players and overall outcome of the Great War? Join us as we explore why it was money that led the US in 1918 to cross the Atlantic and dive into the trenches of Europe. If things had been a little different, maybe they wouldn't have. And the bigger what if about World War I is what if it didn't end? Our sponsor today, Iron Order 1919, lets you answer that question for yourself. It's a free PvP strategy game set in a world where the war and the technological development it drove didn't end, leading to a great war with mechs roaming the battlefields. You play with up to 100 other players in a real-time game that can last for weeks, utilizing the usual array of First World War military assets, as well as more advanced tech like flying fortresses, land ships, and titans. You can do real diplomacy with the other players to shape the map and strengthen your position, and one useful feature is that you can check in on mobile to make sure you don't miss any important developments. Start playing with our link in the description and you'll get an exclusive gift – 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. This is only available for the next 30 days, so check it out now. The global financial system of the early 20th century was based on the gold standard, a hybrid public-private system and by the end of 1913 had reached its very peak. But when World War I broke out, most of the belligerent nations suspended their ties to the gold standard so they could print enough money to pay for their military involvement. In general, a country had various methods to finance their wars, the most traditional one being taxation. Yet for Europe's great powers, borrowing money whether it be domestic or foreign institutions, would be the main method of financing the war effort. The Franco-Russian alliance was the military core of the Entente, and both nations came into World War I with the largest gold reserves in Europe. But despite this, both nations were cash-strapped and as a result could only maintain the war effort through severe state intervention. Let us examine the financial state of both nations, beginning with France. Just before the war, French debt constituted more than 70% of its GDP, one of the highest burdens amongst all the belligerents. To compound matters, the nation had only introduced income tax in 1914, and when Germany invaded, it captured 40% of French heavy industry. France also had a lot of long-term capital investments in Central and Eastern Europe, but they could not be liquidated quickly. All of this resulted in France having to borrow around 84% of its wartime expenditure. Consequently, France became a debtor to the US and UK. Inversely, however, it became a creditor to Russia, Belgium, Greece and Serbia. We now move on to Russia, whose economy was very backwards compared to the other belligerents. It suffered from poor administration, inadequate war materials and inefficient production. However, the massive nation was the key to tying down Germany, and as such, France had invested heavily in it since the 1880s. Russia required enormous amounts of credit to mobilize and sustain its war against the Central Powers, causing its lacklustre economic development to significantly cost the Entente leaders as the war went on. Over the course of the war, Russia would come to owe Britain 5.1 billion rubles, France 1.34 billion and the US and Italy another 2 billion. Of all the belligerent nations, Britain had the most favourable geopolitical standing at the offset of World War I, as it was an island nation and not under direct threat of invasion. As such, the United Kingdom entered the front lines on the continent while intending to maintain a normal civil society with relative economic freedoms back home. Across the Atlantic, America had underwent a recession in 1913. But with the outbreak of the war, its munition plants began to fill with orders for war materials, principally shipped to Great Britain. As a result, an economic recovery proceeded. American production went up 32% by 1917,
coinciding with a 20% uptick in its gross national production. One of the hardest hit industries by the 1913 recession was the American steel industry, but because of the war, demand for US metal skyrocketed. The naval blockade, however, meant all of these goods were going to the Entente powers. Unlike Britain or Germany, the United States did not have government-run central banks. In response, Congress enacted the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, creating the Federal Reserve Bank. This new system was intended to remedy the defect of a lack of a central bank, but would not be operational until 1915. While the majority of the belligerent nations suspended the gold standard during World War I, they all assumed it would be reinstated after the war, and thus sought to maintain their gold reserves. Both France and Russia had reserves dwarfing Britons, but were nevertheless cash-strapped and required British goods to keep them in the war. Thus, before long, Britain started demanding shipments of gold from its allies in order to give them credit. The French and Russians strongly resisted this, both suspecting Britain was engaging in a ploy to hold a financial hegemony after the war. Ultimately, this led to financial stagnation. It was apparent from the offset of the war, Britain could not supply its allies alone, leading the Entente to look towards America. They all required US goods and loans to keep them in the war, but Britain feared the US would use the situation to displace it as the leading global financial power. Britain's goal was to preserve its hegemony over the world's finances, maintain the gold standard, while simultaneously receiving the much-needed goods and loans from the United States. On the other hand, France and Russia, whose territories were facing direct invasion, did not have the same luxuries Britain did to worry as much about their post-war economic situation. The Entente Power's economic decisions were based on the idea that World War I was going to be a short war. Between 1914 to 1915, Britain attempted to restrict France from entering its markets unless they shipped gold. This pushed France to seek short-term loans from the US. The short war assumption died a lingering death as the Entente militaries continuously forecast that the next offensive or set of offensives would end the war. By 1915, the Entente powers realized it was going to be a long war, resulting in a growing French trade with Britain and a British and French trade deficit with the United States. In 1915, Edwin Montagu argued the war had become one of endurance and that finance was ultimately playing a larger role in its outcome than military machinations. This was true in several ways. For one, Britain could not continue expanding its army while financing its allies simultaneously. Furthermore, men were required for the labor to generate the dollars to pay for the American goods. Overall, not only Britain but also France and Russia were facing financial collapse and likely surrender. While the Entente powers struggled economically, the American economy had just come out of a recession, and while President Wilson sought to remain neutral, he could not afford to alienate the European belligerents whose wartime trade was generating his nation's economic recovery. While political and financial interests had been united in opposing war loans in August, by October 1914 to 1915, the situation had changed. American exports were growing, the exchange rate had stabilized, and the threat now was that a ban on foreign credit might shut off the export-led boom. It is here that John Pierpont Jack Morgan Jr. and J.P. Morgan & Co. enters the story. In November of 1914, Henry P. Davison began talks with British officials proposing an Entente loan. At the onset of the war, the Federal Reserve System was not yet functioning, thus dealings with the US were done through countless small banks. This led to uncoordinated purchasing amongst the Entente powers and inflated prices because of competition. Thus the British sought a single agent purchaser. As a result, Cecil Spring Rice began to secure the most influential American financier, Morgan, who also happened to be his personal friend. Britain tasked Rice with finding a way to end American neutrality and bring her to the Entente side, and was aided by the likes of multiple Atlanticist American friends 
who all put pressure on President Woodrow Wilson to abandon neutrality. Rice needed to ensure the continuous supply of American goods, and further tying America's finances to the Allied cause, and made sure JP Morgan & Co received generous commission to keep it so. This led to the appointment of JP Morgan & Co as the British government purchasing agent on January 15th of 1915. By early 1915, the French trade deficit with Britain had grown enormous. The loss of France's industrial regions to German occupation meant that she had to rely upon Britain for many crucial products. To stymie this dependence, France began trying to pave a way for American loans, but this yielded little progress. Thus, France began negotiations with JP Morgan & Co. But at the time this happened, American investors were not enthusiastic about the chances of an Entente victory. General Joffre's offensive in Artois and Champagne had failed to dislodge the Germans, and the British offensive at Neuve Chapelle in March had met a similar fate. On the Eastern Front, the Russian successes in repulsing the Austrians in Galicia only partially offset the German victory in the Battle of the Second Masurian Lakes. France desperately needed to bind JP Morgan & Co firmly to the French cause, as it was the dominant financial power in Wall Street. To that end, easing French credit shortages in the United States was imperative. Thus Alexandre Ribot approached Morgan, asking if he would be willing to become the purchasing agent between France and the US. Russia, by proxy, also picked Morgan as the intermediary for its borrowings on the American market. Through these events, the House of Morgan thus became the credit broker to the entire Entente. In February of 1915, the first joint financial conference of World War I was held between France, Russia and Britain. They agreed to cooperate financially and to dispatch an Anglo-French loan mission to the US, headed by Reading and a syndicate of American bankers led by JP Morgan and Co. The Americans were not confident in the Entente's success, as the German summer offensive on the Eastern Front had expelled the Russians from Warsaw, Brest-Litovsk and Grodno before Vilna fell on September 19th of 1915. Likewise on the Western Front, the outcome of the Second Battle of Champagne did not reassure the Americans. The Entente delegation asked for a loan of one billion, but it was deemed impossible. Over the course of a few weeks, the Commission had meetings with over 100 prominent American bankers and financiers. By September the 28th, the syndicate announced they would loan 500 million, at that point the largest single loan in financial history. After the loan, French and British purchasing agents in the US became increasingly influential. Munitions exports exploded, and JP Morgan & Co financed an enormous propaganda machine using 12 influential publishers and over 197 newspapers to persuade the American public towards the Entente cause. Between 1916 to 1917, various devices were employed, including offering guaranteed British government loans. Several smaller Entente powers would also receive credits from Britain and France, but the money was ultimately coming from the US. To sustain auxiliary campaigns against the Central Powers, the Entente loaned money to Portugal in March of 1916 when it entered the war. Greece took loans from both the Entente and Central Powers before siding with the Entente in June of 1917. Loans were also made to Belgium and Serbia, which were overrun and occupied by the Central Powers, and thus the Entente had the financial burden of maintaining their governments in exile. The US government was not too pleased by the proceedings. By late 1916, a plan was championed by JP Morgan & Co to issue short-term treasury bills in the US, but it was rebuffed by the Federal Reserve Board at the command of President Wilson. Wilson hoped by doing so, he could force the Entente to head his personal mediation proposal to end the war, but his gambit failed. Besides loans, another source of money for the Entente was the purchase and sale of American stock which the Entente powers could surrender in turn to buy more munitions from the US. It is estimated that in the course of the war, some $2 billion passed through JP Morgan & Co's hands, and the commissions on such ventures were very profitable. Yet by 1917, the Entente were running out of credit, 
and had little more to offer than IOUs. Between 1914 to 1917, U-boats had sunk 5,700 surface ships, while 300,000 tons of shipping were sinking every week, and one out of four steamers leaving Britain never returned home. As Arthur Balfour wrote, at that time it certainly looked as though we were going to lose the war. In mid-April of 1917, Walter Page told President Wilson that Britain only had enough food to feed its population for six more weeks. JP Morgan and Co. could not find any new buyers for Entente war bonds, nor fresh funding to replenish old bonds, which were coming due and facing default. If bond sales came to a halt, there would be no more money for the Entente to purchase war materials. America's export industry was in full swing and would come to an abrupt halt if the Entente surrendered with a ton of commissions lost at both ends. If Britain and France were forced to surrender, all the sold bonds would go into default and the investors would sustain catastrophic losses. On March 15, 1917, Ambassador Page sent a telegram to the US, stating the new capital had all dried up. The only way to keep the war going was to make direct grants from the US Treasury, but this would violate neutrality treaties the US would have to abandon its neutrality and enter the war. Colonel Edward Mandel House was a personal advisor to President Wilson, later to FDR, and a close contact of Morgan and adamant supporter of Britain. House began a series of secret talks with Sir William Wiseman, who was working for the Secret Intelligence Service. It is alleged that these talks were dealings on the means whereby the US could be brought into the war. George Sylvester Virek alleges 10 months before the 1916 election, Colonel House negotiated a secret agreement between President Wilson and the Entente, which pledged the US would intervene on their side. The supposed plan was to submit a peaceful settlement for the war, but for the terms to be carefully drafted in such a way that it was impossible for Germany to accept them. If either side refused to accept the proposal, the US would enter the war on the side that accepted. Despite all the secret talks and agreements, the issue of the American public still loomed. Luckily for Wilson, by 1917, multiple events had occurred that swung the public consensus towards the Entente cause, and war was declared against Germany on April 2, 1917. In 1934, US Senator Gerald Nye headed the Nye Committee to investigate the financial and banking interests that underlay the United States' involvement in World War I. The Nye Committee conducted 93 hearings and questioned more than 200 witnesses, including J.P. Morgan, based on four topics. Their findings indicated the bankers had pressured President Wilson to intervene in the war in order to protect their loans to the Entente powers and that the arms industry was significantly influencing US foreign policy during the lead-up to the US entry into the war. The committee reported that between 1915 to 1917, the US lent Germany 27 million, while it lent the Entente powers 2.3 billion, and that the US banks and investors had a significant amount to lose if the Entente surrendered. The investigation came to an abrupt halt in early 1936 when the US Senate cut off the committee's funding due to Nye attacking the late Democratic President Woodrow Wilson. Nye suggested Wilson had withheld essential information from Congress as it considered a declaration of war. Gerald P. Nye, when the Senate investigation is over, we shall see that war and preparation for war is not a matter of national honor and national defense, but a matter of profit for the few. Thanks again to our sponsor, Iron Order 1919, the real-time strategy game in an alternate, unending World War I, available on PC and mobile for free. Use our link in the description to get an exclusive gift, 13,000 gold, and one month of premium subscription for free, for the next 30 days only. We'll make more videos about the First World War in the future, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.